This video is sponsored by Ren. More on them later. Hello everyone, it's Maria and welcome to my channel. Today we will be watching and reviewing yes. Shout out to my Patreons who chose this movie amongst many other movies. This was a good choice. I love this movie. I've seen it many times. I have the DVD. But I haven't watched it in quite a while, so I'm excited to do so again. So let's just watch it. But before that, what do you think about going on a marine adventure with me? I am possibly hosting a trip next year. If this is something that interests you, if you want to go on a marine adventure, go diving, snorkeling, visiting marine reserves, etc, etc, with me and a bunch of cool people, please fill in the two-minute survey that is linked down below. This is just to know how many people are interested, where you would like to go, and a bunch of other details so that we can start planning the trip from there. You will then be further instructed as to what the trip will be about, budgeting, all that stuff, and then you can decide whether you really want to go or not. I'm looking forward for this trip. I'm super excited. I'm super excited to meet some of you. So if this is something that interests you, check down the link down below and let's dive right into the video. No light from the surface. How deep are they? Like mine. 1,700 feet. 1,700 feet. How much is that in meters? So that's around 500 meters. That's very deep. The deepest anyone has ever gone with just a suit without being in a vehicle is around 300 meters. So these guys were really deep and until today no one has ever dove so deep in just a suit. You want us to search for the sub? No. We know where it is. But she's in 2,000 feet of water and we can't reach her. We need divers to enter the sub. Okay, deep sea wreck diving is maybe one of the most dangerous things you can do as a human. Besides that, you are inside a very enclosed space. And in this case, especially, they are going to go looking for survivors. They are probably going to encounter bodies, which might be an accelerator for having a panic attack or losing control, which is something really, really dangerous when you are diving so deep under these conditions. In an ideal scenario, you would ask professional wreck divers to do such a rescue operation or someone who's trained under these extreme circumstances. And by the way, if this is something that interests you, I really recommend you read a book called Shadow Divers. It's based on real wreck di deep sea wreck divers. I'm not afraid of diving or the ocean or the deep, but just reading that book gave me a bit of uh, deep sea diving anxiety. So if you're prone to that, don't read it. But it's a super interesting book and you will get to learn a lot about the dangers of deep sea wreck diving. But my people are not qualified for this. He knows it. This is a but they want that money. They want the green. This looks pretty neat. There isn't anything like this as of now. People are considering doing deep sea mining and some of the machines do kind of look like that. Hang on, gentlemen. Yeah, this, there are submarines like this crude submersibles or vehicles that you can take quite deep to explore the deep ocean. The bad news is we got eight hours and this can blowing down. And the worst news is it's gonna take us three weeks to decompress later. Decompression sickness is probably the most dangerous thing that can happen to divers. When we're diving, we are breathing compressed air and that compressed air, especially nitrogen, is building up in our body, in our tissues, in our muscles. If you ascend too fast, that air will expand very fast and it can cause many problems to your body. Basically, your blood starts bubbling that can cause severe injuries and ultimately death. That's why you have to ascend very, very slowly or make decompression stops or safety stops, which is usually what divers do. And the deeper you go, the longer you need to reach the surface and the more safety stops you will need. And that is just to give time for that nitrogen that is in your body under pressure to leave, to give time for the nitrogen to just, so that when you reach the surface, you're body is not a soda can. If everything goes right, you do not need to decompress in a decompression chamber where after you dive, even if you dive deep, if you do all the safety steps. If it happens that you so that you do need to go into a decompression chamber, it's because something didn't go very well during the dive and that you ascend it too quickly for the time and the depths you are underwater. Each other. 
closely for signs of HPNS. High pressure nervous syndrome. Muscle tremors usually in the hands first. Nausea, increased excitability. Exists. In a partridge in a pear tree. This guy's so annoying. It's not really clear who will have HPNS. This is something that really exists. It's really unpredictable and no one can know who is gonna happen to have this, uh, this problem. Also, it only happens to people who are diving really deep. Normal recreational divers wouldn't come across this issue. It's more like people who are diving, I don't know, below 100 meters or so. This looks so real. Like all these machines, this looks... I mean, they used a real set. All this is like real stuff they built for this movie. The making off of this movie is insanity. If you have the time, check out a documentary called Under Pressure. Everything was filmed underwater in this massive tank. One, I think was the largest freshwater tank anyone ever built. And they had a bunch of problems because it was, the conditions were so harsh. It's a super interesting documentary. It's called Under Pressure, The Making Off of the Abyss. I recommend you watch it. Respect, man. Respect. Is this respect? I don't know. Am I doing the Hunger Games? I don't know. They're using dry suits, by the way, I think. Dry suits keep you dry, ideally. And that's usually what you use for real for diving in really cold waters. Oh yeah, here comes this part. Fluid breathing system. Anyway, you breathe liquid so you can't get compressed. The pressure doesn't get you. You mean you got liquid in your lungs? What, what are you doing? Hey, hey, hey. No, 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 no. I don't know if this would be allowed to be done today. This scene is real. This liquid really does exist and this rat was really put inside that liquid. This is a liquid that has a high concentration of oxygen and allows for oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange in your lungs. And because you are breathing liquid, you can go uh, and dive under higher pressures. However, this has, to my knowledge, I will correct myself on the screen if this is not true, has never been successfully tested in humans. So I, they might have already tested in humans, but I don't know if it was successful, not that I know of. But it has been tested in rats and apparently it, it, it was relatively successful. By that I mean the rat didn't die and there was gas exchange happening. One of the issues that probably comes from breathing through liquid is that you need the liquid inside your lungs to be ventilated somehow or at least to move around. The other issue is the accumulation of carbon dioxide because not only not having oxygen is a problem but having too much carbon dioxide is also a problem. So you would probably not be able to be breathing this liquid for very long before the concentration of carbon dioxide is a problem. But uh, who knows, with technology nowadays, who knows if something like this will be ever possible in the future to be used in humans. But it would be cool, I guess. Uh, I don't particularly like the idea of having liquid in my lungs. Doesn't sound like it's something that is I don't know, comfortable? There's only very specific liquids that have properties that, in which this would be possible, by the way. Perfluorochemicals. Perfluorochemicals are one of those. No, he, he, he's seen digging it. He take, yeah, thanks. Okay, now we let the fluid drain from his lungs. There are full face diving masks that allow you to communicate underwater like you see here. These specific masks that you see in this movie were created for the movie. They needed uh, suits and masks that were very light because the actors were hours and hours filming underwater, but they are based in masks that actually exist that allow you to communicate underwaters, underwater. They are, there's some pros and cons uh, in relationship to the normal, you know, goggles plus regulator. One obvious pro, of course, is that you can communicate with other divers underwater because your mouth is not occupied by a regulator, your whole face is covered, and you can have intercommunication devices to communicate with each other. A con, for example, is that you have much more difficulties equalizing. Equalizing is when you release the pressure that is caused in your eardrums by the pressure of the descending in the water. You usually need to blow this to your nose and blow so that the eardrum, the pressure is counteracted by your breathing or exhaling. You need special training to learn how to equalize in a full face diving mask. I personally never experienced it, but it's, I would love to actually. It looks like it's much more comfortable. Another con, if you lose the mask, you use your breathing apparatus and that's very dangerous. When you're using goggles and a regulator, if you lose your mask, you are still breathing. It's no problem. You can 
relax, breathe in, breathe out, and proceed to look for your mask. In a full face uh, diving mask, the mask is your oxygen supply, so if you lose the mask, you lose that, and that's much more dangerous. You need to react much more quickly, you need to get your mask much faster, and that can sometimes be difficult. So there is, of course, some things to consider when you use such a mask, and I would like to try them one day. Yeah, this guy is not not having fun right now. I wouldn't either. And he's uh, he's feeling that he's just having a beginnings of a panic attack. But there won't be enough to run the heaters. In a few hours, this place is going to be as cold as a meat locker. Now the deep sea average temperature is four degrees Celsius. That's kind of it. Yeah, it's kind of like a meat locker. This looks so much like a tenofer, like these colors. This like changing colors, fluorescent, bioluminescent colors. We know James Cameron is fascinated by the deep sea. I mean, the man went to the Challenger Deep, which is the deepest point in the ocean by himself. So if that doesn't tell you that the man likes his deep, I don't know what will. <laughs> in this movie, he really explores his fascination for the deep sea and these like jelly-like forms with these changing colors and rippling motions, which are characteristics that a lot of deep sea animals have. And not only deep sea animals, like comb jellies, which this uh, alien machine reminds me of, exist in the surface. I've been swimming in the middle of a bloom of them in the Mediterranean Sea, for example. But there's also things like salps, there's also fish that have these kind of really graceful movements, not only on the deep, obviously, but the the deep has this mystery associated to it because it's much more difficult to reach and also because it's very dark and a lot of animals down there are bioluminescent and you can really easily see it when you encounter them. So this kind of mysterious feel that this movie has really, like, I think captures that very well. Oh, no, that guy don't look good. Coffee, my man. Or is it just me? You don't look good. HPNS or the high pressure nervous syndrome can indeed like decrease mental performance, cause tremors, but I'm not sure it would increase paranoia. I don't think that is a symptom of HPNS. Uh, this guy is clearly not only, you know, decreasing his ability to think critically, he's also becoming paranoid. Could be that he was just paranoid already before having HPNS and it's just increasing it, but that's not a symptom of HPNS. Water periscope in the house. Oh, I forgot, we could we actually see all of it. Oh, that's so cool. Looks like a pyrosome. Pyrosomes are like these free floating colonies of little animals or called tunicates. And they look they can look kind of like that, like this 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 cone-shaped colonies. They form circular or cone-shaped colonies and they can be huge. There's photos of uh, divers next to pyrosome colonies and they are enormous, like meters in length. They can measure up to 18 meters in length. 18 meters. They, that's crazy. They are totally harmless. Uh, they just, they're just, you know, chilling there, floating around in the water, but they do exist. Oh, so far yet so close. Or so close yet so far should I say. The emotional climax of the movie, or one of the emotional climaxes. What's the plan? I drink this water a couple of degrees above freezing. I go into deep hypothermia. My blood will go like ice water. So her idea is that she will drown and her, her she will go into hypothermia, so the body functions because of the cold will be slower and she will be able to still be revived. The issue with this, the guy just said he needs eight minutes to swim from here back to the main, to the rig. Probably will take longer if he's carrying her. Three to five minutes without oxygen can be enough for severe brain damage. So in this situation, even if she could be revived after all this time of being like dead, she would probably not do so without having some type of brain damage. For me, it would suck if she, if, if they would be so accurate with science that she would die in this moment. Obviously, I like that, the fact that she doesn't and that she's fine. But in a real life scenario, this situation would probably not pan out as it does in the movie. Pum, pum, pum. There are really like these clips in which there's this range of rock range that just ends and there's this drop down into the abyss. 
In oceanography, we divide the ocean in layers. There's the epipelagic zone, mesopelagic zone, bathypelagic zone, and the abyssal zone, and the Hadal zone, which comes from, yes, Hades, the master of the underworld. I was going to say wonder world. No. He is now, what depth? I forgot. 2,000 meters deep? That's still the bathypelagic zone. In the dark. Yeah, he's clearly having Freezing. some pressure effects. I mean, he's under extreme pressure. <laughs> Literally and... Emotionally. 12,000 feet. Jesus, I don't believe you. Yeah, okay, so now he's reaching the abyssal zone. He's almost at 4,000 meters. It took him 30 minutes just to get down there. There's no way he can swim all that way <laughs> up. Okay, this is where the movie kind of loses people. <laughs> I mean, that's beautiful. Okay. Yay! Happy ending. We all love a happy ending. So that was it. The Abyss by James Cameron. I like this movie. Aliens and all and cheesiness and all. While we do not have these kind of machines to use uh, to extract oil, there is an increased lobbying to start deep sea mining because there's a lot of uh, minerals in the deep sea that we use for a lot of our technology, like cell phones, chips, and stuff like that. And a lot of the machines look very similar to what we see in this movie from an ecological point of view and from a general world point of view, it can be very dangerous. We still don't know a lot about the deep sea. We don't know how disturbing the crust and the, the deep sea floor will influence everything else on earth. The deep sea is highly understudied. There's still a lot we don't know. We know a lot, but we still there's a lot more that we don't know. It's very dangerous to undertake these kinds of operations at the deep sea without knowing uh, how that is might impact the overall ecosystem. But you know what's also not good for our planet? Too much CO2 in the atmosphere. That's why... A word from our sponsor, REN. REN is a website where you can calculate your carbon footprint and then offset it by funding a diverse mix of carbon reduction projects, like planting trees, mineral weathering, and rainforest protection. Once you sign up to make a monthly contribution, you receive monthly updates from the projects. You get to see exactly what your money is spent on, with photos and details of the projects. I was going through their projects and I really liked this one where they provide indigenous Amazonians the tools they need to detect deforestation earlier, which allows them to prevent further deforestation. I strongly believe that to fight the crisis we are in, local communities play a vital role, and this project is a great way to help local communities protect their surrounding nature. Personal responsibility is not the sole answer to fix the climate crisis we are in. We do need systemic changes and we need action from many sides. But helping projects like this is a good way not only to help the world, but also support local communities. The first 100 people who sign up using the link in the description will have 10 extra trees planted in their name. Thank you very much, Ren, for the good job and for sponsoring today's video. Let me know what other movies you would like me to react to. This is a more serious movie compared to like the Deep Sea, the Deep Blue Sea, or the Meg. Something that you would like me to react to or review, uh, let me know down below. Thank you very much for watching this video. Thank you to all my Patreons on Patreon for making this channel and my other channels possible. You can check my Patreon, all my links down below. Check out Ren. Thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.